Oh, man. Is it okay if you keep standing, or does that bother you? No, you can stand up. You can stand up. One time I was teaching a class as a visiting professor one summer, concentrated classes, and they said, can you sit there all day and keep talking? I'm going, yes, I can. <laughs> so if you need to say, I need to stand up, walk around a little bit, that, that won't bother me at all. Okay. I'm just looking over to make sure I got I got to cover two two folders today, so we need to keep moving here. Um, we've looked at the anatomy of an organization. We've already talked about the four continuous tensions. I think before I talk about this next one, I want to give another handout here. And these are simply leadership styles. So, Logan, there's one on the, again, this is on the, these are under files. They're complementary leadership styles. It's from Gangle's book, Feeding and Leading, page 24. And... I guess what's probably worthwhile looking at this is to ask yourself, what, what is my natural leadership style? Analytical, driving, expressive, or amiable? So based on just the way you've watched me conduct meeting so far since this class has get started what would you say about me am I more analytical more driving more expressive or more amiable and see they've got all those words in there to help explain what those labels mean What? Expressive? Well, thank you. That's nice to be called expressive. Some people like to use the word highly opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you see me doing? also be considered amiable, I believe. You think? Or think. Oh, you're so nice, Daniel. <laughs> I'm not the easiest guy to get along with. Well, you've graded me nice so far. So, <laughs> <laughs> so even though it's not my natural inclination, I've studied leadership styles enough, I've embraced some of these things to where Daniel could give me a little amiable stuff. Thank you, Daniel. Do you see me doing any of those other two things, being analytical or driving? Mm, yeah, I think so. See, those are the two that I'm naturally. And the other two I have to work at. Because what is it we're trying to be as a leader? We're trying to be balanced. And for two of you to point out things that are not naturally my personality says that I'm working hard enough at doing this to where I'm, I'm what, reflecting that side of the leadership style. You, you have to, you say, well, yeah, but that's just not me. It's like, well, guess what? You have to get beyond just being you when you're in a position of leadership and to become a balanced leader. Now, granted, I mean, I like that one, driving, that describes me, but everyone who knows me knows that if they go someplace with me, they say, uh, do you want to ride with me or do you want to drive? I go, I'll drive. I just don't like riding with other people. I like being in the driver's seat, and, and so that's just naturally me, and I'm analytical, mathematical, 
analyzing things, breaking things apart. And that's just me. But I have to work at those other two. If I want to be a balanced leader. So, kind of, and have, there are some, I think, leadership inventories on the internet. There are places you can go where you can take, answer questions, and it'll tell you what kind of leader you are. But be careful about that. Okay, there was a time a number of years ago, a long time ago, when this school had an academic dean who left on real short notice to go to another school. And the president of the of our of Calvary was shocked by that. And he came to me and he said, Tom, he said, I'm in a real bind. My academic dean has just left to go bec to become the president of another college. And he said, and I need to announce that I have an academic dean very quickly. Would you be willing to help me and serve as my academic dean? And I said, so long as I can keep teaching all of my classes because my passion is teaching. And he said, yeah, I can let you do that. So I said, okay, then I'll agree to do it on one condition. He said, what's that? And I said, that you keep looking for a long-term academic dean, and when you find one, then you let me go back to teaching full-time, because that's why I came here to work at this school, is to be a teacher. Even though I've studied all this stuff and I know how to do it, it's not my passion. And he said, that's great, that's fine, that'll work. And he went out and found an academic dean eventually. But when I was teaching this class during the time when I was the academic dean, some of those online inventories on your leadership style, I noticed that while I was serving as academic dean, my leadership style profile changed as opposed to what it was before when I was just teaching. Well, do you have to have a different approach to being the academic dean than you do to just being a classroom teacher? And I made the adjustment in my thinking and took on the role and it affected the, my perception of the world that around me and the way I answered questions. So just understand that sometimes it could be if God calls you to do something because you have the, the wherewithal and the capacity to do it, if he calls you to do it, he'll give you the grace to handle it. But for some things, it might only be for a short period of time because it's not what you're passionate about. It's not what you want to spend the rest of your life doing. Because I've known for years that God's calling on my life is teaching. And I would never walk away from the classroom to do anything else other than that because teaching is my passion and that's what God's called me to do so I focus on that but it doesn't mean I can't do other things temporarily but you can only do temporary stuff so long before it starts to wear you out and you you have to you have to learn how to to make decisions about what are you going to do about that so be aware of your style and then be aware of trying to develop a balance in your style. If you're just naturally an easygoing, amiable person, there will be times when you'll have to analyze what somebody's doing and tell them if they don't do better, they don't work here anymore. And we'll have later on in one of these folders I've got down here, we'll talk about how you go about firing somebody. Uh. We get to practice. <laughs> no, we don't get to practice. But it's a very painful process. And it hurts to do it. But if you don't do it, here's what happens in an organization where you won't fire somebody who needs to be fired. The good people in your organization leave because they want to work for a better organization. And then if you do live that way long enough, you end up with an organization full of people who ought to be fired, and all the good people have moved on. That is not a healthy organization. So the best thing to do is when it comes to it, just to bite the bullet and say, hmm, we're gonna to have to let this guy go. When I was a school principal, 
I had a teacher who was a popular teacher and he was a good teacher and the kids liked him but here was his one flaw he would teach in Bible class here's a Bible class with kids from 15 different churches in a Christian school and he would teach his Baptist distinctives Anyone know anything about Baptist distinctives? As thus saith the Lord. He didn't have a chapter and verse, but he didn't need it because it was a part of his Baptist heritage. And I said to him that you can't do that in our Bible class. You have to stick to teaching the inspired word of God and then leave different churches to make choices about what they do with that. He said, well, Tom, I just can't do that. I'd have to violate my conscience to do that. I said, well, I can't ask you to violate your conscience. But what I can ask you to do is to get another job working someplace else and what kind of school should he work for? A Baptist school that has only Baptist students who want him to teach the Baptist distinctives. He goes, so what are you telling me? I said, I'm telling you that I can give you a good recommendation to get a job working at a school where you won't have to violate your conscience because I'm telling you that if you keep teaching your Baptist distinctives between now and the end of the school year you will not have a job here next year he said well I've been teaching my Baptist distinctives ever since I started here I said yes and this school has grown and it's grown to where it's more than just a few Baptist churches coming here and it never was a Baptist school and it doesn't intend to be a Baptist school and you have to accommodate all these other churches or go to work someplace else. He goes, but I like working here. I said, I know you do and I'm telling you, you're not going to have a job if I hear any more comments about Baptist distinctives in your Bible class. And he just did not and I have some good friends one of my best friends was a Baptist and he said Tom you know he said you know what puzzles me about you and I said what he said that you don't go to a Baptist church now I, I go to a Baptist church now but at that time I didn't and he said he said you know what I'd be if I wasn't a Baptist and I said what he said I'd be ashamed <laughs> he was, and he was a marvelous guy and he said and you know what really bothers me about you I said tell me he said that you're such a good Christian I said, why does that bother you? He said, because all the good Christians are supposed to be Baptists. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was where he came from in life. And, and I purposely, because I worked in a school that had a lot of Baptists, I purposely befriended Baptists to let them know that I wasn't out to sink their ship. And, they, and they're neat people. I like them. And they're not all that hardcore, okay? But those hardcore guys, they have to, they have to Im immerse themselves in a Baptist ministry where they fit right in because that's what they want done there. Okay, so that's enough of that. Let's move on to, uh, oh, page 39 in uh, Dayton's book. The local church is the most difficult organization to manage because it seeks at the same time to care for its members and to use them for its ministry. So we open our doors and say, we want everyone in the community to come to our church, right? To worship God, to grow spiritually, to fellowship with other Christians. But then, once you come in the door, we say, we need some help. Can you help in a nursery? 
Can you help clean the church? Can you help serve food? Can you help with our outreach to the teenagers on Friday night? We want everyone to be involved in some ministry. It's like, well, what if I started coming to your church because the reason I'm coming here is because the last church just worked me to death. And I said, the only way to get out of this is to change churches. So we came here, and he said, I'm just all burnt out. So can I just sit here and rest for a while? And when I was in a church where I was in a position that helped new members get acclimated into the ministry, I said, yes, you can. And I'll put a note on the card with your name on it. You're a new member, so eventually we're going to get you involved in some ministry here. But we're not going to burn you out because we have a lot of people working in this church. So we don't put all the work on one or two people. So, But, but because you've been burnt out, we're going to give you some time to kind of acclimate and get to know the ministry. And, and how about, say, a year from now, I will call you and talk to you about what area of ministry you want to get involved in. Will that be enough time? He said, that'll be enough time. And then in a year, I call him and I said, so, now that you're all rested up, what area of ministry do you want to be involved in? He goes, boy, that's a tough one. He said, I don't know. There's lots of things here going on that I really enjoy. He said, can I have some time to think about it? And I said, you know, while you're thinking about it, we need some workers over here in this area. So why don't you help out over here while you're thinking about where you'd really like to immerse yourself in the ministry? Did I sometimes make new members feel uncomfortable? But that was my job. <laughs> my job at church was to make sure that everybody got involved in the ministry somehow. And I would just call them up and say, hey, I'm looking at your ministry involvement and I don't have a record of what you're doing here. What are you involved in? Well, you know, I'm not really involved in anything. Well, we need to get you involved in something. Because if this church keeps growing, we're going to need everybody helping carry the load. If we don't, a few people get burnt out, and we don't want to do that to anybody. So we want everybody involved. And one of the reasons I bought into heading up that ministry in church is because, have you heard of this adage that people sit and soak and sour? People who aren't involved in the ministry eventually become very critical of the ministry. And all criticism does is chip away at what's going on. So I, I need people involved. <coughs> so my job, and I loved it, my job was to take new members and work with them in, individually. The pastor, I mean, if the pastor says, you know, the reason we're short of people in the nursery is because we've got some people in this church who just aren't volunteering to help. And some of you need to step up to the plate and volunteer. Now, you know when he makes that announcement, you know who feels guilty? The people who are already volunteering. And you know who's not listening? The people who aren't doing anything. And that's where yours truly comes along. I don't know why. Maybe it's my background as an insurance salesman. Um, but... I don't have any qualms about picking up the phone and calling and saying, Daniel, I noticed on your card here, I don't have written down what you're involved in. What are you doing in this ministry? And if you say, well, I really haven't done anything for a while, well, it's time for us to get you involved. Here's the areas where we need some workers. Which area sounds most interesting to you? I say, that's not on the list here. <laughs> we all keep the pews warm every Sunday. That's something everybody's doing. We need some workers over here. Which area would you like to try? 
and I'll just keep working with you till I get you involved in some ministry. And sometimes when people think, well, I don't know if I could do that. I said, well, let's try it for a while and see what happens. And then, and this is, and here's one of the reasons I enjoyed doing this when I was, this was my ministry in church, is that it, it was like, they said, well, I don't know if I like that. I said, well, try it, and if it doesn't, you don't like it, then do it for a couple, three weeks, and we'll find something else for you to do. Um, but right now, we need some help in there. Okay, so they help out. They go, you know, this is really fun. I like this. I said, well, let me talk to your supervisor, see how it's going, and see if we keep doing this. And all of a sudden, they discovered they liked something they didn't know they liked. So my ministry was not just getting all the people involved, but it was helping people find places where they could develop a passion for ministering to people and get involved in stuff. So it is, it's a, it's, it's, the difficulty is that we're saying, come in here, we want you to be a part of our fellowship. And then once you come in and say, now we want you to be a part of the staff, the, the one of the volunteer, we want you working in our fellowship. And say, well, I'd like to just be a spectator. No, we don't need that. We need everybody doing something. And and it doesn't have to be like everybody's a teacher. We don't need everybody being a teacher. Although, since we're talking about that, I had a superintendent of school, a special superintendent calling at the time. He said, Tommy said, I don't know what to do. And I said, what's the problem? He said, See, I'm a problem solver. I like helping people solve problems. And he said, I can't get anyone to teach Sunday school. And I said, you can't. And I said, he said, no. I said, well, who's teaching now? And he told me. And I said, so do they like what they're doing? He said, well, he said, yeah, but they're getting tired of it. I said, well, it's because you're burning them out. So the people who are teaching all year round, Tell them they don't need to teach all year round anymore. When would some of those all year round teachers like to have a break? In the summertime? So let's find someone. Can you see where someone who's a teacher in school and has the summer free might say, that would be fun to teach Sunday school for just the summer when I'm not busy in school. So I'll find some school teachers who will step in and teach your class for the summer. And then some guy goes, wow, I didn't know being a teacher could be so much fun. Do you have any classes that I could teach in the wintertime too? I said, well, let's see what we can find. And if your church is growing, can you see where you're going to need more teachers down the road? One time I actually talked to a superintendent. And he said, you know what the problem is today? And I said, tell me what the problem is today. He said that nobody wants to like make long-term commitments. I'm going, what do you mean by that? He said, nobody wants to teach for the whole year. I said, well, that's okay. If you have four Sunday school classes and you have four people teaching and they teach all year round, you could have eight people teaching if each of those four people only taught for six months. Then you would have more people in your church teaching. Because you surely have more than four people in church who are qualified to teach. So let's have eight people teach, each of them for six months. Or we could do what? Have 16 people teaching for how long? Three months. So now we're asking for people just to teach for a quarter. Say, yeah, but you're going to need 16 people doing that. Did you know that in some churches, you can find 16 people who would teach for a quarter, but you'd have trouble finding four who would teach all year round? You just have to, basically, what? I want everybody to be involved in the ministry. I just have to be accommodating some of, some of what their personal needs are when I'm scheduling to teach and not asking them to do more than they feel like they can handle. Okay, but that's why it becomes a, a struggle. Uh, page 41 and 44 in Dayton's book 
talks about the organizational growth cycle. This is how organizations grow. Yeah, this is, let's see, from your science class, your biology class, do you remember a picture of the ecosystem, the water cycle, the biological cycle? So here we are with an organizational growth cycle. And let's start at the top with the picture and talk about, uh, what's the first thing? We have a purpose. What is your purpose in life? Do you have a purpose? Have you taken a theology class that talked about man's chief aim in life? Your purpose for being here. Why is your purpose? What is your purpose for being? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, where did Catholic, you get that? The Catechism, Westminster. The Westminster Catechism? Man's chief aim is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. What's your purpose in life? Is it the same as Daniel's? You say, no, it's not mine, it's the Westminster Catechism. Well, what is your purpose in life? Well, my purpose in life is to find the easiest job I can find and then make enough money to pay the bills and just spend my life, have a life of ease. No? My purpose in life is to become the richest man in my family. What a disgusting thought. <laughs> kind of makes me sick to my stomach to think about a guy making money his ambition. I want to become famous. So did Hitler. <laughs> Can't you people find a better purpose for life than just looking at Hollywood or wealthy people or awful people? I mean, is that a noble purpose in life? To glorify God, to spend my life glorifying God and enjoying my relationship with Him both now and forever. So, you see why we're going to have to develop an organizational purpose? So, so as you collect these purposes and put them down there, be thinking about what are we going to what are we going to give our organization? Our four little boxes with whatever chart we put together and whatever name we put on it. What's going to be the purpose statement? And it says first you establish a purpose. And if you had to put in one phrase, what's the purpose of the orphanage in Guatemala? To care for these children and teach them about Jesus. And what's the purpose of this youth ministry in Europe, Daniel? Reach new teens and prepare them with a biblical worldview. Reach these teens in Europe and prepare them with a biblical worldview. Talk, what is your what is your purpose for going to Japan and working with these young people? Seeing the multiplication of discipleship. To see the body of Christ being multiplied. To see young people becoming a part of the church. Becoming a part of God's family and uh, growing in their faith. And reaching out to others. That whole discipleship thing. Where you come to Christ. You grow in Christ. You tell your friends about Christ. They come to Christ. They grow in Christ. And this thing just keeps going, just like a wheel rolling down the road. Well, and so the purpose 
then from purpose we go to setting some we set some goals now you guys have already been putting some goals up there but let's think about your purpose and then say so give me one goal that grows out of your purpose one of your goals when you get to Guatemala is to To have an orphanage atmosphere that glorifies God. So when the children come in, they're walking into a godly atmosphere that'll set the stage for them wanting to have a relationship with God. So you see what's happening? He's saying that this, and, and then, and I want this orphanage to have this godly atmosphere. And so then you make a plan. So what's your plan, Esther, for making a godly atmosphere in this orphanage? Well, one thing would be hiring like whoever's in the house, the you know, the helpers being good godly people. I'm going to make sure that the people who are helping here are godly people who reflect God in their relationships with the kids. Because sometimes godly people can be less than godly. Hey, nobody's perfect. We all know that. Everybody has a bad day. Yes, that's true. But based on my observations, the last five have all been bad days. So you've used up your bad days for the whole year. It needs to get better. What about your quiet time with God? What about your walk with God? What about your prayer life? Are you asking God to help you be the person he wants you to be when you come to work here? No one's ever talked to me about that. But you understand? Say, that's where my plan is to, to take these people and make sure this staff is being godly. And what's the action I'm going to take? Oh, I just talked about it, didn't I, Esther? The action is... I'm going to check people out. Look for indicators of godliness. And then where they're not correction, where they need to be admonished, where there needs to be some changes made, we'll make some correction, and then we'll evaluate. What was our purpose? To have a godly environment here? So, so have we made this environment in our orphanage more of a reflection of what God wants it to be? Yes, we have. Has it been painful? Yes, it has. Because we've had to talk to some people. But the people you've talked to, some of them, it's, you've helped them grow in their spiritual walk by helping them be better workers, so they're thankful for it. And the ones who didn't want to make the adjustment, you've moved them out and brought in some new people. And the new people you've hired, they said, the reason we, you, I mean, can you see Esther saying this? The reason we have a slot for you is because the last person who was here didn't understand what it means to offer these children a godly environment. This is what we mean. We show them the love of Christ. And we have to have that love in our own hearts if we're going to show it to the kids. And if it doesn't work out, if you don't have the temperament for it, then you'll be out the door and we'll hire someone to replace you. Ah. Ah. That's why we're going to have a section on how you fire people. Because can you see where? And, and, and what? If we come down here with the planning, but we don't do anything, things left to themselves. Let's see. If I just leave my office to itself, it'll eventually just kind of straighten itself up and be orderly. If I just, 
if I close the door, maybe when I come back, my room will be tidier than it was when I left. It's the law of entropy, people. With time, things decay and fall apart. And we have to bring in some order to make things better. So, now, okay, your purpose in going to Europe is to do what, Daniel? To do ministry. To, to, to reach these kids. To reach the teens and to get prepare to, them with the biblical worldview. With a biblical worldview. So one of your goals to make that happen is... Um, now, see, you can have a goal that has to develop a biblical worldview or you could have a goal that has to do with bringing them in. Mm -hmm. Like one of mine is um, to establish connections with the people who are already Christians in the country so they could help. Okay, so I'm going to establish connections. So my goal is to bring in some, okay, so we're talking about the goal of bringing in some new kids, aren't we? And so my plan is to establish connections with Christians who would be able to help? Bring who, who would help me figure out what can we do in this community to get kids to come out of their homes and and become a part of what we're doing? And have do you have any idea what some of the things people are going to suggest to you? They're going to suggest you do when you get to Europe. What learn the language? But, um, yeah, you're going to say, I'm going to have to learn their language, and what else? And Have you... Just learn how they work and the culture of that community. And do you know what a lot of people do in Europe to get unreached kids to come to some place where you can talk to them about a biblical worldview? Camps and stuff like that. Camp? You want to go to camp? And what do these kids say? Is it free? And you say, well, it's not free, but we've got some sponsors who are paying the bills for you to come. Well, sign me up. Well, what do you do at camp, you might say. And what do you tell them you do at camp? I just tell them about like games or whatever you'll be doing. But also what kind of games are you going to play at camp, Daniel? I don't know. <laughs> oh, cause, but see, see where all that's the planning stage? Now, since I've been to Europe, I know a little bit about what happens there. And here's what they're going to say. You say, well, what if we had a soccer clinic at camp? What if we had some guy come in and some guy who's, a, who's played professional soccer, and he's going to give you some pointers on how to be a better soccer player? Those kids in Europe are nuts about football, and it's not the football we watch in this country either. That'll, that'll get them there, won't it? They, they don't care what you're going to talk about if you're going to help them improve their soccer game. So we're going to plan to bring in some Christian who's played professional soccer, and he's going to do a workshop. Oh, that's our action. See, See what happens? Action. And then what happened? Whoops, we got some kids here who didn't want to follow the rules. Now, what's our purpose? To introduce them to a biblical worldview. So here's the rules for our camp because we embrace a biblical worldview here. And some little camper says, well, I don't care about your biblical worldview. I just came here for the soccer. And you look at him and smile and say, well, guess what, Charlie? The people who are paying the bill for you to be here are given the money because they embrace our biblical worldview. If you don't want the biblical worldview, you don't get the help to improve your soccer. You need to fit in and comply with our rules or we need to send you back home. I don't know if I want to keep growing or not. I mean, you understand why this is called a, you see how it's called a growth cycle? Because if we stop short anywhere along here, 
we're not going to come, we're not going to make it all the way around to our purpose being fulfilled. So you shift little Charlie out. And what happens at camp? Have you ever been to camp where someone would shift home? For being disruptive and bullying people or misbehaving and making a scene? You've never been someplace? Have you ever been any place? Have you ever been in a youth group where someone was uninvited? Have you ever been in a school where someone got expelled? And what impression did it make on you, Esther? Totally stupid. <laughs> <laughs> These people are serious about their expectations. Right? <sighs> you see our dilemma? But we want to reach everybody. But we're not going to accomplish our purpose if we don't... Uh, this sounds terrible, but... I know from my years of working in Christian schools that if I ship one kid out, the rest of them will shape up real fast. Would you all agree? So who has to be the sacrificial goat? That's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and do I feel bad about sending him down the river? Yes. But if I don't send him down the river, what does he do to our worldview that we're trying to incorporate here. Kind of erode it from the inside. He does. He erodes it from the inside. And the Bible talks about scoffers and how to handle them and what to do with them. And there's many times I had to say to a parent, but they'd say, but what about my child? And then I'd say, I know an alternative for your child. I know a school that's designed for helping children who are being as rebellious as your child is being. But we're not set up here to handle that kind of thing. And it breaks parents' hearts. But if we're going to go all the way around the circle, we have to do it. And then after we've done it, we evaluate it. Was that a good decision? And I still remember a time in Peoria when we were starting a new high school years ago. And we made a decision to put a kid out of school. And a month later, the police were called to his house because he had threatened to kill his mom with a firearm he had in his room. Well, I think maybe we just spared ourselves some serious grief, didn't we? I mean, that, that shooter could have been coming to school. And, and maybe I should, based on this little story, talk a little bit about our world today we live in and the world you live in. Um, all this talk about these people with mental problems getting a hold of guns and killing innocent people. Okay, now, do we have the whole picture here? It's not the gun that just got up and killed some people. It was somebody who has some serious mental problems. Would we all agree? Okay, so here's my question. Why is this seriously mentally ill problem person being allowed to have a firearm? And why is this mentally ill person free to walk the streets and be a potential danger to society? 
Can any of you know an answer to that question? In other words, is the problem the firearm or is the problem that we're giving way too much freedom to a whole bunch of nutcases in the world? Now, what's the, what's the media's solution to the problem? Take all the firearms out of the world? If you removed all the firearms from America, what would all the nutcases, what would all the mentally ill people in America do when they want to express their rage and injure other people? They would use baseball bats? So then we will do what? We'll outlaw all the baseball bats in the world. You understand what I'm talking about here? Am I making sense? If we really want to address the real problem, the real problem is we have a person who's a danger to society, who's being allowed to freely walk the streets of America till they do something catastrophic. Now, you know why that never happened when I was a young person years ago? There were places where people like that were, they weren't incarcerated because they hadn't broken any law, but because they were a threat to society, they were institutionalized into a mental institution. And guess what? A number of years ago, Somebody decided that people in mental institutions, if they've done no harm to anybody, should be allowed to freely roam the world like everybody else. And the people at the hospital said, the mental hospital said, but who's going to make them take their meds? And they said, if they don't want to take their meds, they shouldn't have to. And that became the dominant thinking in our society. And guess what we have now? We have potentially dangerous people walking the streets without anyone doing anything to protect society from them. And I don't want to be the one to make the call on all these people, but do you understand? Something has to be done. And every time I read about one of these cases where somebody did something, if you go back and do the background story and read the background of the guy who went into the school and shot all those people, why did his parents allow him to have a gun? Well, because that was the one thing in life he enjoyed. If your kid is a troubled kid, what's the one thing he should not be enjoying? Guns and knives. Why wasn't there anybody in the world who was telling these people this? No one saw this coming. It's like, nope, we just wait till somebody collides with society and then we blame it on the firearm or on the school for not having better security. And it's like, put the blame right where it belongs. On the child who is so unstable, they shouldn't be allowed I mean, we do this with with uh, pedophiles. Once a guy's been convicted of being, being a pedophile, what happens when he serves his sentence and he gets out of jail? You know what happens to him? His name is put on a list of what are called sexual offenders, and it's published. And he's not allowed to interact with children say, well, hey, wait a minute. He did his crime. He paid his time. No. He demonstrated he has a character flaw that says we put restrictions on it. So why can't we do that with other people? And I'm thinking that we were a safer world when uh, we had a few more restrictions. Of course, it used to be that the restrictions, I mean, when I was a teenager, if a teenager 
was a reckless driver. He got his license suspended. And you know what that meant? That meant he didn't drive a car anymore. What happens today if a reckless teenager gets his license suspended? He quits driving. You guys know what happens? He keeps driving without a license. I'm thinking, who's letting him do that? Where's the supervision? Where's the parents? Where's somebody saying, you can't drive anymore? I'm thinking they should have taken his car away. They should have done something to say, you can't drive a car. Okay, anyway, you see how this, you, you have to evaluate, is this working? And if something's not working, then let's talk about, let's go back to say, what do we need to do differently? Okay, that's enough of that one. What's my next one here? So, the organizational growth cycle, purposes and goals, planning, taking action, making corrections or adjustments, evaluation, and then back to repeating the cycle again. What are we doing now? Rush chapter one and two. And wouldn't you know, I have a handout for Rush chapter one and two. So all these handouts will help you answer the questions on that test when you get to the end of the week. What do we got here for Rush? Page 13, or page 5 in the new book, depends on which book you're reading. Management is meeting the needs of people as they work to accomplish their jobs or their task. Management is meeting the needs of people as they work to accomplish their jobs or their task. So, I'm the manager of this class. So, what do we determine that you need as you work to accomplish your job? Looks like you need some goldfish, <laughs> Oreos, Popcorn and fruit snacks. And water. <laughs> so you understand that if we're going, if you're if you're going to successfully complete your task today, and I'm the manager, I need to meet some needs so you can get the work done. And and what did Esther just ask for? What did she say? Is it okay if I do what? Stand, Stand up once in a while. So it's just sitting here, listening to you talk about this stuff. I need a break. <laughs> it's like, okay, you get one break for 10 minutes. We go two and a half hours, take a break for 10 minutes, and go the other two and a half hours. Oh, man. The last two and a half hours is going to wear you out. Say, that's why I need some snacks something to chew on and I said that's what will happen that'll that'll happen that'll take from uh, also from Rush's book so so basically the takeaway for you here is that when you're in charge of something what are the needs that the people have that are working under you and you guys need to you guys need a break halfway through and you need some snacks. Now, I don't need either one of those. I could go for the whole five hours. As long as I got my bottle of tea or a bottle of water. You ruled that one out. <laughs> you guys ruled tea out, so I'll just bring my own stash for that. <laughs> That's, but, but you understand? It's like, okay, so I'm in charge, so everybody has to do what I'm doing. No. You have to say, what do the people need? When I became, years ago, when I became the academic dean, the first thing I said to the academic secretary is I said, well, I said, I'm the academic dean now, but I said, before you had an academic dean who was here all day, okay? I'm over in the education building in the morning teaching classes. So that means you're kind of in charge of the office here in the morning. 
but I'll be here all afternoon for meetings and things. So anything that comes up in the morning that needs my attention, you just schedule it for the afternoon. You don't even have to talk to me. You, you own my afternoon schedule. Now, now, the fact that I'm not here in the morning because I'm in class, you can't call me. I focus on teaching. I'm only doing this job as an afternoon job only. So what do you need to make this work? She said, well, I have your authorization to tell everything that comes to me in the morning to reschedule for a slot to see you in the afternoon? I said, yes, you do. And she said, and I don't have to ask you about the afternoon schedule? I said, nope. You set it up any way you want. And she said, that'll work. You understand? I had to give her what she needed to do her job successfully. And then I said, now, I'm already creating a little tension for you by the way I'm doing this job because my only being here in the afternoon puts an extra load on you. I said, what could I do to make your life more comfortable in this office? And she didn't even hesitate. She said, this chair that I sit on all day is terrible. And I said, so you need to go to Office Max and sit on all the chairs till you find one that just, just like, what is it? The little girl with the porridge and the beds. That little story. The three bears. The three bears. What was her name? Goldilocks. Goldilocks and the three bears. And the one porridge was too hot, the other was too cold, that one was just right. And I said, you need to go to Office Max and find a chair that's just right for you. And she smiled and she goes, really? I said, really? I said, I'm not going down to the business office and ask if they have another office chair for you. They're probably all cheap chairs that aren't comfortable. And she looked at me and said, because sometimes the people in charge who make decisions don't have to sit in those chairs all day, so they have no idea what it's like. Or they already have a big cushy chair, and the secretary gets a little cheap one. I'm thinking, if anything, who should have the more expensive chair? The secretary or the guy in charge? Based on servant leadership. The secretary. The secretary. So, she picked out her chair she wanted, and I bought it for her. Not out of my money, but with my departmental budget. Boy, do you think I didn't get some grief from some people? Tom, if you buy your secretary one of those high dollar chairs, the rest of our secretary is going to want high dollar chairs too. And you know what I said to my fellow workers? Shame on you. If you know they want one and need one and you're not giving it to them, shame on you. All the books I read in the administrative process say you take care of people's needs. You find out what they need, you meet their needs so they can do their job successfully. Yeah, but you know what that's going to cost us? See, such short-sightedness. Okay, even if I spent $200 for that chair, when you could buy cheap ones for 70 or 80 when she's comfortable all day long, in a chair that I bought just for her, is she more productive? Will she even work harder than she did before because she appreciates the chair I gave her? I will get my money back from that expenditure 15 times over in the productivity of that person who works under me. Why can't people figure that out? That's not rocket science. It's right out of the books. The books will tell you that. So why won't people do that? If, if the people who work under you say, you know what we need? Why wouldn't a person say, well, 
Let me supply that need. Thank you for telling me. I'll go get whatever you need to make your life easier so you can accomplish your job and do your job well. Why wouldn't people have that kind of response? Because as soon as somebody, okay, okay, why wouldn't your supervisors at work walk up to you and say, so do you need anything? Why wouldn't supervisors walk up and ask that question? Cost money. That's exactly right. If I say, do you need anything, what are you going to say? Well, yeah, since you ask, I would like to have, and it means I'm going to have to spend some money to buy something. So let's not spend any money. Let's just not meet people's needs and see how productive they are. That is so, what'd you call that a while ago, Esther? That is so dumb. Don't do something stupid. Yeah, it gets you kicked out of school. Don't do something stupid that damages the productivity of our organization, of our operation. And when I was academic dean, I walked into a meeting one day, the first meeting of the year with the faculty. I said, and so based on what we're teaching here, and what did I have to say to them? So do you people need anything? And I thought they would say, nope, we're all ready to go. That's what I thought. Ah, you should have heard them. And it was like, one person said, well, I don't know about the rest of the people here, but the, okay, have you ever seen any overhead projectors around here anywhere? Those little boxes with a glass top and a little thing that shines up and, and shines light on the wall? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what we used to use before we had all this other paraphernalia. And so they, they said, the overhead projector in my class, there's something wrong with it. And I'm going, really, which room is that? And somebody said, it's the same in all the rooms. They're all bad. And I'm going, what? And they, they go, I said, when did this happen? They said, it's been this way for three or four years now. The overhead projectors around this campus are just a bunch of junk. Well, if everybody's overhead projector isn't working, how come the school hasn't replaced them before I became the academic dean? What'd you say, Daniel? It what? Money. It costs money. Okay, so let's throw all the overhead projectors away and just go back to teaching without them like we did before. No, you have to have them, so, but we have to have them, so we have to have old, worn out ones because we can't afford new ones. And I, I left that meeting, I said, before class starts next week, I will have new overhead projectors in your classroom. So after the meeting, I went down to the business manager and I said, we need to buy some new overhead projectors. He said, why? I said, because the ones in the classroom don't work. And he said, well, then let them teach without them. I said, that's like telling the people in maintenance that who say, they say the lawnmower's broke so we can't mow the grass, and you tell them to mow the grass without a lawnmower? He goes, it's not the same, Tom. I'm going, it's the same. And then he said, well, there's no money in your budget for new overhead projectors. So you can't buy any. What did I just tell the faculty? You'll have new overhead projectors. What did I find out as the new academic dean when I went to talk to the business manager? That he controlled the purse and he was saying no overhead projectors will be purchased. Now if the lawnmower broke, would he have bought a new lawnmower? Because he understood that dimension, but he didn't understand the educational dimension. So I went home and said to my wife, well, Nina, something just came up at my new job that I hadn't planned on. She goes, what's that? I said, so it's a good thing you're working because I need some of your money since I can't get it from the business manager to buy overhead projectors for my teachers. She goes, how much do you need? I said, oh, I don't know. I think I need about 
10 overhead projectors, and I think they cost about $300 a piece. That's a bunch of money at a poor school teacher's house. That's 3,000 bucks. And she said, well, if that's what it takes, and I guess that's what it takes. Praise the Lord for my life. I said, well, I'm going shopping. And then I said, Lord, I don't really have $3,000, but I'm going to buy some new projectors for these people one way or the other because they need them to do their job. They have to have their needs met if they're going to do their job. And I started calling around, and wouldn't you know, I found a guy who said, you know, I happen to have 10 of these projectors that I'm wanting to get rid of. I said, what's wrong with him? He said, well, the switches on them keep burning out. And he said, people keep bringing them back, and I'm tired of messing with them, so I'm going to phase this model out, and I'm not going to handle it anymore, and I'll sell you all 10 of them for $100 a piece. I just went from spending $3,000 down to what? Spending $1,000. So I spent the thousand dollars, got the overhead projectors, because I figured if the switch burns out, it won't burn out the first month, you know. So it'll last, so that'll take care of the problem. And so then the business manager says, "Where did you get these overhead projectors?" I said, "From this guy in town." What'd you pay for them? I paid a thousand dollars for them. Oh, he says, "Is that all?" I said, "Yes, but they're my overhead projectors because I paid for them." You know what he had the nerve to ask me? Can we pay you for them so the school owns them? Once I got them so cheap. Now, what did my old flesh want to say? Nope, they're my projectors. I'll let the school use them till I'm ready to take them home. But what does the, what does the spiritual leader say to the business manager? Upsell them for 150. <laughs> <laughs> nope. You just say, nope, you write me a check for a thousand dollars and they're all yours. Go ahead and put your sticker on that says this is the property of Calvary University. Back then it was Calvary Bible College. I mean, you just understand? That's just what you have to do. Sometimes to meet people's needs, you have to pay the bill out of your own pocket for the sake of getting the work done. And then the guy who said no to the purchase wants to pay for it. Even when I bought a new desk for the academic dean's office, I bought it for 50 bucks at a place downtown where they take old office furniture, and it was a beautiful desk. And he saw the new desk, he said, where did that come from? I said, from this place downtown. For 50 bucks, I just picked it up, paid him $50, hauled it out here in my pickup. And guess what he said to me? Can we reimburse you for the $50 and the desk belongs to us? And I wanted to say, nope, it's my desk. When I leave, I'll take it with me. But what did I say to him? What's the spiritual thing to say? Yes. Because see, what did God do? God provided the overhead projectors. God provided the desk. It's God's provision, not my provision. God was just good. I was the vessel that he did the good through, so do I keep all the goodness to myself or pass it on to the larger institution? And what's the right thing to do? See, you guys all know what to tell me what's the right thing to do, right? So you understand when you're in that position, that's why I'm telling you some of this stuff. When, you're, when those things happen to you, you go, it's just time for me to pay the bill, and give the glory to God when things turn out right. I mean, let's talk about young people. I was teaching a Sunday school class with a bunch of the kids were getting pumped up to invite their unsaved friends to come to class. And I said to the Sunday school superintendent, you know what I need? I need a box of Bibles to put in my Sunday school classroom so that all the kids are using the same Bible. So I don't have to say, turn to Galatians chapter 3. I turn to say, turn to page so-and-so. And all the kids are on the same page so the new visitors don't get embarrassed. So I said, 
can you buy me a, a case of 20 Bibles for about $10 a piece? Nice Bibles that we can use in class. And here's what he said. We'll have to go to the board with that request. I said, well, I didn't know he could have spent $200 for a Sunday school class. And he said, would you come and present your case? And I went to the board, presented my case. And the treasurer said, you know, spending $200 for those Bibles is a pretty healthy expenditure. I don't know if we can really squeeze that out of the budget. And I looked at him and I said, let's turn the air conditioner off for one Sunday. And the money we save, we can use that to buy Bibles for the teenager's Sunday school class. And if it doesn't pay for it in one Sunday, then let's use two Sundays without air conditioning. Any idea what the business manager said to me? You know, or the church treasurer said to me about that suggestion? We can't turn off the air conditioning. People would have a fit. Now, you don't need air conditioning to have a worship service, right? But we'll spend hundreds of dollars to keep people comfortable to sit and warm a pew. Isn't that what you talked about being, Daniel, a pew warmer? To sit and warm a pew, but we won't spend $200 so the kids and the teenagers can, can actually look at what God said instead of just hearing me tell them what God said. That just seems to be wrong. So, my request was turned down. So, what did I come home and tell my wife? Looks like we need to spend $200 on Bibles. And I, uh, she agreed, so I called the Sunday school superintendent and I said, go ahead and order the Bibles, because by him ordering them, you don't have to pay taxes on it. And I said, order the Bibles, and I've got a check to pay for it. And so I took the check up to church and gave it to him to pay for the Bibles. And guess what happened? They gave me my check back. Why'd they give me my check back? <laughs> Here's what happened. I said, what's this all about? He said, well, he said, the, the pastor and the, and the church treasurer talked about it, and they said, of all the people who teach at our Sunday school, Tom is the lowest paid person on our staff. And he's the one that's spending $200 for Bibles. The church ought to pay for that and not make Tom pay for it. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad they paid for it. But do you understand? I didn't know that was going to happen. But you have to do what's right to meet the needs of kids. If you're going to, if you're going to do the ministry, you meet the needs of the people you, that you manage. And often that means you just take it out of your own pocket. Okay. Almost all, this is uh, from Rush again, chapters 1 and 2. In the new book, page 8. In the old book, page 16. Almost all organizational problems fall into uh, three basic categories. Oh, and I think that's a test question too. And it's answered here on this, uh, on this handout I gave you. The... What are the three basic categories of problems? Now, you've already done your interviews, right? And asked people about problems. Okay, think about the problems that you were brought to your attention in your interviews. And here are the three categories. Lack of commitment, lack of unity, and poor communication. Now, I'll flesh it out a little bit. Lack of commitment to working toward the goal. Lack of unity within and between departments and poor communication. So, poor commitment and disunity and poor communication. Would you say that all the problems that were that you found out from the people you interviewed would fit under those three categories? You could draw a circle again and make three parts and put all the problems under uh, commitment Unity and communication. Every time someone says people just being selfish, what does that mean? That what I want is more important than the larger group. 
Okay, what's the smallest unit, organizational unit, that all of you have belonged to? Experientially. What's the smallest organizational unit that you've ever belonged to? Your family? Probably. Your family is the smallest organizational unit. And by the way, all this organizational process stuff, this administrative process stuff we're teaching, that we're studying here, all this stuff you're learning is applicable to a family unit, as well as a large international operation. So the smallest organizational unit is a family unit. Okay, so all the family problems could be categorized under commitment, unity, or communication. The smallest family unit started out with just my wife and me, right? So here we are, a husband and wife together. And where are problems going to arise? Communication and what? Commitment and unity. What did I do every time I discovered I needed something and I was going to have to spend my own money for it? Not my own money, Tom. There's no such thing as my own money. It's what when you're a married person? Our money. Our money. And I didn't know it, but when I took on the job of being academic dean at this school to fill in for a while, I didn't realize how much I was going to need my wife's income <laughs> to help me buy things, to meet the needs of the people who worked under me. Because that just wasn't a part of the history and the commitments of the organization that I was a part of. And I didn't know that because I was just over here doing my job as a professor in the classroom. I wasn't aware of all the things that went on in the administration building until I moved over there to do that job. And that was a long time ago, so things are different now. But that was a long time ago when that happened. Three or four presidents ago. Remember, I've been working here since 1980, so I've been around a long time. So what does that mean? Okay. We're going to communicate. I'm going to talk to her about the money I need to spend. It's our money. Are you agreeable to this? And why would she say yes to spending that money for students in my Sunday school class or students here, for faculty here at school where I work? Why would she say yes to that? Because she made a commitment. What did she say? Did, what did my wife vow when she married me? Do you have, are you familiar with those vows, Esther? <laughs> the prayers sure. for which are performed. Till death do we part. So she followed through on her commitment. Right? Well, what about you and your commitment? Well, what commitment did I make? For better or worse, richer or poor, sickness and in health. So what did I do? I asked her, I consulted her before I made the decision. I'm the head of the household. I don't have to consult anybody. Being head of the household doesn't mean you don't consult anybody. In fact, Servant leadership would say, what does the head of the household do before he makes a decision? Guys, what does the head of the household do if he's going to be a servant leader in that, in that organizational framework? Get in, others in on the planning process. That's exactly right. That's exactly what you do. Which means... Every Sunday after church, we ran through the same little routine. Well, girls, we had two daughters. Well, girls still do have two daughters. Now we've got 
two son-in-laws and all of a sudden I went from having two daughters to what do I have? Six grandchildren? Two girls and four boys. What's that all about? Whoa. That grandson stuff is a whole new thing for me. But what happens? Every Sunday after church, so girls, what do you want to do? Go home and eat sandwiches and watch football or uh, go out to dinner at a restaurant. Let's vote. What do you think happened when we voted? The four of us in the car. I always got outvoted. There was one vote to go home and eat sandwiches and watch football and three votes to go to a restaurant. And the girl said, Dad, why do you keep voting every time? You know what's going to happen. And wh what's the answer to that question? And of course, my answer is, because I want to include you in the decision-making process, but that's, is it that servant leadership that you involve them in this process? And then you don't do what you want to do. You're committed to doing what they want to do. See, I always saw my home I mean, one guy and three women. Anyone know what that means? Esther knows what that means. It means the one guy gets outvoted all the time. <laughs> That's what it means. Why do you think God set me up with one man and three women in his home organizational unit? Since I'm such a driver and so analytical. So that I could get outvoted on a regular basis and then have an opportunity to do what? As the scripture says, to humble myself before God and do things his way, practice servant leadership, so I could become a more effective leader in other organizations. My church, my school, wherever else I'm working. So, what are the three areas of problems? Commitment, unity, and communication. What are we going to do to maintain unity? How committed are you to what's going on here? Do we have clear communication? Are we communicating? I send out all these emails before the semester starts trying to communicate, and no matter how much I tried to communicate, when I came in here and said, let's see, what there were three things, three discussion pages, the ones about a name, did we get that one? The ones about goals, the ones about purpose statement, and I thought someone said earlier, I must have missed that one. Did well, you? S I did it during the class, so I have it now. But ah, <laughs> but you missed it before. Before. Now, okay. So, <laughs> so, now. so now, Daniel, <coughs> whose problem is that? Is it his problem for missing it, or is it my problem for miscommunication? Both. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you answered before Daniel. <laughs> what, were you in, what were you inclined to say, Daniel? Uh, nothing. <laughs> but you, you understand? It's both, isn't it? And I have to assume responsibility for my part of not communicating clearly, and Daniel assumes responsibility for his, but what? We're both committed to the organization and we want to maintain unity. So we both admit to our shortcomings rather than blaming the other guy. If it wasn't for you, it wouldn't have been, wasn't for you. You know, it's like, no. And you know what I've discovered in life? This is, okay, have you ever been in a situation where, okay, both people are wrong, but, but Esther, both people are wrong, but you were only 10% wrong, and the other person was 90% <laughs> wrong. Have you ever been in a situation, anybody been in a situation like that? So what do you do? Say, well, since I'm only 10%, I wait for the 90% to apologize. Oh, you do? What would a servant leader do? Apologize first. Apologize first. And guess what that happens? What happens when you apologize for your 10% error? It's amazing how often it encourages them 
to apologize for their, okay, for half of their 90%. <laughs> I've discovered there's some people in this world who just have trouble apologizing. So, my ministry to them is to help them learn how to apologize by hearing me apologize for my shortcomings. And then they eventually start to apologize for some of theirs. <laughs> One time I had a student that he would get in trouble all the time. And after school he'd say, okay Mr. Bonine, three teachers wrote me down for messing up today, but two of them, I didn't do anything in their room. So the teacher just sat there and said, oh, there's Todd not doing anything and I'll write him up for it. No, that didn't work that way. But anyway, I said, okay, let's talk about the one where you did the wrong. What was going on there? Okay, let's talk about the other one. Let's talk about the other two. And so here's what would happen. I'd say, okay, it sounds like you said you weren't doing anything, but you were doing something that bothered the teacher. It just, you didn't know that she had a rule about that or it bothered her. You got to become more sensitive to teaching. He said, okay, I agree. I said, okay, so here's what happened. You got three offenses here. One of them you admit to. The other two are questionable. I'll penalize you for one of them and forgive the other one. And he would say, okay. I said, so let's talk about the one that you're being penalized for. You admit to that. He said, yeah, I do. I said, okay. So see, I was getting him to admit to something that he'd said he didn't do anything wrong before. I'm working on this guy to help him learn to be more honest in his own personal assessments. So the teachers say, so did you meet with Johnny about the problem? I said, yes, and I, and he admitted to two of them and I forgave him one of them. And they go, what? I said, you know, the, the guy has a problem in confessing his sin. He has a problem in admitting that he's wrong. So I'm kind of helping him work that direction. I'm easing him into it. And then one day in class, he said to a teacher when she wrote about something, well, go ahead, I'll just have Mr. Bone and I forgive it when I talk to him after school today. And she conveyed that to me in a message. And he, after school we met, I said, and you said this to her? And he said, yeah. He said, I probably shouldn't have said that. I said, you probably shouldn't have said it? There's a question about that? He said, no, I shouldn't have said that. I said, well, did you do something wrong? He said, yes, I did. He said, well, have I ever forgiven you one where you knew you were wrong? No, you haven't. I said, well, what were you thinking? He said, I don't know. I guess I wasn't thinking. I said, sometimes you open your mouth and say things without thinking, and it gets you in trouble, right? He goes, right. I said, you need to ask God to help you get a handle on this mouth thing of yours. He said, yes, I do, Mr. Bonine. And he said, so are you going to forgive this one? I said, what do you think? He said, probably not. I said, no, I'm not. I said, and by the way, you probably should know something that you're the only student in this whole school that I do this with. Because everybody else, when they do wrong, they're just man enough to admit it and take their lumps. But you want to argue about everything as if you don't do anything wrong and you're doing wrong all the time. And he goes, what? I said, I'm just telling you that we're trying to work with you here. We're giving you a little bit of grace and you're trying to take advantage of it. He said, I don't need any favors. He said, I can carry my share of the load. I said, ah, uh, it doesn't look like it. Not until you learn to just own up to your man up and to your misbehavior. And he said, well, I can do that. And just like that, he quit trying to argue with teachers about writing him up for doing stuff. Because he realized that we were, in other words, he, he realized that he wasn't as mature as everybody else was in school, and, and he realized he needed to man up and grow up and get it right. But have you ever met a young person like that in your life? Okay, whenever you meet one, just make a note of this. He didn't get that way. If he's not like everybody else who can own up to being wrong, he comes from a history, you know, history. He comes from a background where what's happened? Every time he does something wrong, somebody makes an excuse for it. And he's never learned to just take his lumps. Were any of you ever in school when you decided to make a smart remark to a teacher just to entertain your friends and you knew you would get nailed for it? 
but you did it anyway because you figured that the joy of entertaining your friends was worth the slap on the hands? Am I the only one who ever did that? I was homeschooled. So, <laughs> so you didn't have to worry about that. I knew. See, I went to school a long time ago. I knew the teacher would walk by and say, Tommy, hold your hand out. And she would have me hold my hand out like this. And she's carrying a ruler, a little wooden one. And any, I know, anybody know what she would do with that ruler? Smack me on the back of the hands. And it hurts. If you don't believe it, get a wooden ruler when you get home and <laughs> pop it up on the back of the neck. It hurts. And I would sit in class and go, I know I'm going to get wrapped on the knuckles for this one, but I'm going to do it anyway because I can take the pain. I enjoy the accolades for my classmates. And here's what my wife says. Tommy, you were one sick, twisted young man. It's a good thing you got saved at 18. Who knows what would have happened to you? Because she was just a little goody two-shoes all of her life. But can you see when I was a principal, those kind of guys who thought like I did, I saw right through them. And I concluded that it was God, one of the reasons God made me a school principal is because my mission in life was to help these kids grow up and see life from a biblical perspective. To help them become the kind of people that God wanted them to be. Because when I got saved at 18, I, I used to think, how come someone didn't tell me this sooner? Of course, later I realized somebody did try and I wasn't paying attention and I wasn't interested. And it's like I was just some kind of little messed up kid, you know, who wouldn't listen to what they had to say. So I thought, okay, so you suffer the loss, Tom, but don't blame the other people for it. Okay, uh, what's the last thing I have here from Rush's book? The organization that focuses on using people. This is from page 31. The organization that focuses on using the creativity of its people will discover workable solutions to its problems, find new and better ways of accomplishing its task, and increase productivity. So how did we use your creativity to discover workable solutions to the problem of sitting here in class five hours a day for five days straight? We talked about snacks for some reason, and you guys came up with some creative alternatives, and we're going to have them tomorrow to solve a problem. No, Daniel already solved that problem. What is that you brought in here, Daniel? Trail mix. No thanks. But did you get some, Ty? Have you had some, Esther? Did he? Is he not sharing it with you? <laughs> <laughs> that looks like good trail mix. Do you guys like trail mix? Do you guys like trail mix? I've never tried. What What's the name on that? That's Walmart brand, isn't it? What's it, what's it say on the front? Walmart Tropical Trail Mix? That looks healthy. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop on the way home and get some more of that so we can have plenty of it to last all week long. That's good stuff, isn't it? Okay, now is there something else on this handout that I have failed to talk about? Right in the middle on page 30, new ideas are quickly killed by statements such as we've never done it that way before. And here's how you counteract some of that. We've never done that before. Our church just started a program where they said, here's what's happened. We have kids on Friday night who, after sports events at school, down here at Ray, uh, Raymore High School, kind of get in trouble and we're looking for a place for junior high kids to go 
a safe place where they can hang out with some supervision and have some fun activities. And they said, would you be willing to open up your church with your little basketball court and recreational area for those kids to come and hang out and have some people volunteer to supervise them? And the church said, that sounds like a great idea. That's a great ministry. We'll do that. We'll open up our little our church and, and have some stuff for them. And what did somebody at church say? We've never done this before. Well, we've never had the high school ask us to do this before. It's a new opportunity for ministry. Well, where are the parents of these kids? Well, obviously they're absentee parents. I mean, you understand? They're just not there. So it's like there's a need. So we've never done it before because the need wasn't there. Don't rock the boat. No, we won't rock the boat. We'll just sit here and let it sink. That'll never work. Well, what can we do to make it work? I mean, just kind of figure out ways to counteract some of this negative stuff. Why risk failure and jeopardize our good standing and name when we know this works? Well, if what we're doing works, we probably don't need to change it. But are there some new things we maybe ought to be thinking about doing that we haven't done before? So we don't have to quit doing everything in the past. In other words, we could start on a WANA program and still have Boys Brigade. But eventually what's going to happen is probably a lot of the Boys Brigade people are going to start going to a WANA and that program is going to wither up and die. And, and I think that's just letting nature run its course. But if you say, no, there's no reason why we're not, we're big enough where we could have both. I like under this chapter summary statement, people are an organization's most valuable resource. People are the most valuable resource. I had a guy this class years ago whose father owned a, a paving company. And, and we were going through this stuff and he said, you know, this is really interesting. You said, I've been sharing this stuff I'm learning in class with my dad. And he said, my dad said the other night, he said, you know, this is so funny. He said, this high dollar equipment that we use for paving roads, we keep it in a big fence lot. We hire people to maintain it, and we have people who are there 24 hours a day to protect it and guard it. But we have the people who come to work every day who drive the equipment, and we don't do near as much to look out for their welfare to make sure they're healthy and alert, you know, and all that kind of thing. Because it's almost like we we take care of people. We take care of stuff, but we don't take care of people as much in our society. Have you ever heard that saying? If you get a good horse, you just ride him to death, you know, in an organization. It's like, no, if you get a good horse, you use him, but you let him, what, keep going long enough to where you have him over the long haul not burn him out. And, and and I say, if you find somebody in an organization who's really doing a good job, then make sure you protect them from being, from burnout. There's no reason for people to get burnt out, especially, it breaks my heart to see people who get burnt out, and then all of a sudden they were making a contribution, and now they're not doing anything anymore, because they're just, I got burned out once, now I'm not doing that again. And and I, be, I used to say in a church where I used to work where where I was in charge of getting people involved in ministry, I'd say, we will not overload you in this church. I promise you, we will not overload you. My job is to keep track of these cars and make sure nobody is doing too much. And sometimes that meant when somebody said, I want to start working in this ministry, I'd say, well, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to give up this one because we don't want you being overloaded. Well, I think I can handle both. Well, yeah, but but we've got other people. But can you see, if you're getting everybody involved, we've got other people who could work in this area where you're leaving from. So let's let it... Let's, let's leave some work for everybody to do it. Yeah, I think that's enough of that. All right. So we're finished with this first week's folder. That means we go to the second week's folder. What do we have here? Now, we just had a meeting. So... Let's see 
if you could write some minutes for the meeting that we just had. Let's see, what would be the first thing that would go on the minutes? The minutes of the meeting should contain the following information. The name of the group that is meeting. So what would we put down here in the minutes? The administrative process on campus students met to discuss what? Snacks. for class, for class time. The date and the time of the meeting was, what's the day? January what? Seven. Seven. When did we have that meeting? Like 8.30. About 8.30? Okay. The members present were Dr. Bonai, Cock, Daniel, Esther, a copy of the agenda or a summary of what was going to happen. Whoops. I had an agenda in my head. I didn't give it to you, did I? Missing. So whenever you conduct your meeting, be sure you have an agenda. Say, I had one, I just didn't announce it. So what was the agenda that I had? Find snacks. To assign snacks? Is that what you said? <laughs> no, just find snacks. Find snacks, to find snacks. Okay, so the agenda was to find snacks. Or was my agenda to have a practice meeting? <laughs> Involving snacks, but we'll call it finding snacks. Enough detailed information to clearly communicate to a third party what happened at the meeting. So what should I put down for what happened at the meeting? We, uh, made suggestions for snacks. Then what do we do? Then we did what? Assigned. Assigned. Snacks. To people. What did you call that process we did there when we took all the snacks and we... We narrowed the choices to four. Is that what we did? Mm -hmm. The four snacks. Then we assigned snacks to people. And that was it, right? Now, we could put down who we assigned, who was assigned what, but that pretty well, does that communicate to a third party what happened in the meeting? We made suggestions for snacks. Then we narrowed the choices down to four snacks. Then we assigned snacks to people. Now, if you follow, all of us, our minutes would be, all four of us wrote maybe a little bit different stuff in our minutes, but we're all doing the same kind of thing. So when you, when you conduct a meeting, after your meeting's over, you can write up the minutes of your meeting 
or you could ask somebody in class to take minutes for your meeting. The reason I didn't ask you to take minutes yet is I hadn't given you the handout on what goes in the minutes for a meeting. Maybe I'll have to have another meeting down the road to take care of that. Let's see. Keep this stuff straight here. Put all this stuff together. What's my next handout? Well, it looks like Here's a handout on biblical leadership. What's that all about? Have you heard of spiritual leadership by Oswald Sanders? You quoted that in your paper, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I've enjoyed reading your papers. Those are good papers. You go, why didn't you tell us they were good papers? I don't know. I just don't put many comments on papers. All I do is identify typos. And I think the best comment is when you put the hundred beside the other hundred. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best comment I can make. Huh? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, this is from Gangle's book, Feeding and Leading. The sources of biblical data in understanding spiritual leadership are essentially five, four of which relate to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we're limited somewhat to a study of models, both positive and negative. There are very few Old Testament didactic portions, though one could draw inference from verses in Proverbs and many of the prophets. A second source is the direct teaching of Jesus. Here we're led to passages like Matthew 18, Mark 9, Luke 9, and Luke 22. Leadership in the church is different from leadership in the world. Would you agree with that? That leadership in the church is not like the leadership you see out there in the world. But guess what? There's a whole bunch of people in the world who are picking up on Christian leadership and realizing how effective it is and so they plagiarize the Bible you know why I say they plagiarize it they don't give God credit for it they take God's ideas and they write books on it and they sell their books and they do seminars and they make organizations more productive isn't that interesting so that they never give God credit. But I don't think God's offended that people take his ideas and use them to make life better in the secular world. But there's just a lot of people who just don't want to recognize that all these good ideas about leadership come from the Bible. And uh, the the books he mentions here, a third source is the example of Jesus in leadership. And one of the things that, <clears throat> that, I don't know who got me started doing this, but they said, if you're going to be a leader of others on a regular basis, the, the guy who led me to Christ got me started reading through Proverbs. A proverb a day, and you read through the whole book of Proverbs every month. And he said, that'll help you acquire wisdom. And somewhere in life, somebody got me started reading through the Gospels. Just, in fact, one time, I don't know where I got this idea from somebody, but I decided to take a red letter edition of the Bible, where all of the things that Jesus said were in red, and then I thought, I'm just going to go through the four Gospels, and I'm going to read, just read what Jesus said, and see if I can reconstruct in my mind what went on in between the stuff that's described in the Bible. But, but just running the words of the master teacher and the master leader through my head every summer before I started a new school year. Can you see what that does to my way of thinking and even to my way of talking? It's just it's just 
going through all the words of Christ that are recorded in Scripture and getting, getting a fixation on the way Jesus saw things, the way he talked about things, the way he said things, could help me be a, a better leader and a, a better teacher. And then uh, The Training of the Twelve by A.B. Bruce and Michael Yosefs, The Leadership Styles of Jesus. And we also have New Testament leaders like Peter, Paul, Stephen, Philip, Barnabas, Timothy, Titus, and many others. And finally, tracking down New Testament passages which lead us to didactic passages like Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Galatians 6. These are all passages that when, whenever you're going to be involved in leadership, you say, I just need to look at these. And several of you have referenced these in your uh, leadership philosophy papers. And I appreciate that. But this is good. That's good information. Okay, what's the next one? Ah. What is this called here? Natural and spiritual leadership. Natural leadership is a self-confident person. Spiritual leadership is a high degree of confidence in God. So, are you rather, are you rather self-confident? Or does all of your confidence come from being confident in God? It all comes from God. Mm-hmm. My wife says, "What are you doing, Tom?" I said, "I'm reading books on how to build a garage." She goes, "You're going to build a garage?" I said, "Yep." She goes. Can you do that? I said, of course. <laughs> have you ever done that before, she says? I go, no. What does it have to do with anything? You read a book, you buy some tools, you build a garage. She goes, I don't believe you. <laughs> Is there something wrong with a person who thinks like that? Yes, he's going to get himself in a whole bunch of trouble. Ah, guess what happens when I start building this garage and I encounter something that gets me in trouble? I go, uh, Lord, can you bail the boy out? I think I'm in trouble. So people who have a lot of self-confidence eventually have to have confidence in God if they're going to be as successful as they want to be in life. People who don't have any self-confidence, doesn't matter. If you have enough confidence in God, what will God do? He'll, what? He'll do the work through you in spite of your lack of confidence. And he'll do the work through me in spite of my self-confidence. But can you see what you have to be careful about if you don't have very much self-confidence is that, that I don't say no just because I'm a little timid about it. What I have to be careful about is that I don't do it in my own confidence rather than doing it God's way. You, you follow what I'm talking about there? There are dangers to both kinds. But do you see where a lot of people who are naturally confident become leaders, but they don't necessarily become spiritual leaders. And some spiritual leaders, is this okay to say this? 
some spiritual leaders spend a lot of time over on the natural side without being sensitive to the needs of others and to the way God wants things done. And maybe that's why what this guy said about reading the words of Jesus for a self-confident person, I need to read the words of Jesus so my confidence in him grows and my confidence in myself diminishes. What about uh, making decisions? Do you make your own decisions or do you seek to find God's will? I think Proverbs helped me in that regard. 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. I'm coming into school today to get ready for class. I got my books, my box of stuff here. I got all my handouts available. I think I'm ready to go. But what do I say? Lord, help me to do this job right to meet the needs that these students have that come to class so that this will be a successful experience for them this week. And how do I feel about teaching a class that went from being a semester class to an eight-week class to a one-week class? I'm kind of having fun. <laughs> Am I an adventuresome spirit? It's just like I have this appetite for trying something different just to see how it goes so you guys are kind of an experiment for me and I'm going to enjoy this week no matter how worn out you get in the process <laughs> <laughs> uh, originates your own methods or finds and follows God's method okay now here's the danger confident people I'm building this garage and it talks about doing something that doesn't quite make sense to me when I'm putting up the rafters for the roof. So I'm going, I know what I'll do. I'll drive over to this neighborhood where they're building new houses and I'll just sit out there and watch these guys putting rafters on houses to see what they're doing. And I'll watch them and learn from them. Then I'll go home and that's where I'll put rafters up. That's just old time figuring things out. And then it's just like, uh, I get back to the house and I'm going, you know, that book said something about these braces you can put on there. I think I better go to the lumber yard and get some of those braces just to make sure I'm doing this right. Then I get to the lumber yard and I'm looking at all the different kinds of braces and I'm going, wow, Lord, what's the boy supposed to do? And then all of a sudden, I reach my limit where I said, I don't know where to go next. And then it's like, well, Lord, what should I do now? Which braces should I buy? So when I get to my end of my own mental machinations, I go, can you help me again, Lord, figure this out? But then, did I wait till I started building a garage before I asked God for help? Oh, no. Back when I started the process, I said, Lord, if you don't want me to now, I've prayed this prayer a number of times. If you don't want me to do this, please stop me. Have you ever prayed that way? Because you sometimes just say, I'm off, I'm on my way. If you don't want this, Lord, you stop me. I'm going to be listening to you and sensitive to you. But then I said, and help me make the right choice about the kind of garage and about the lumber to buy and all that kind of thing. So it's kind of you mix it together. So sometimes I find my own ideas and sometimes I just ask God to help me figure out what to do next. And sometimes God just, you go, Lord, I'm stumped. Can you help me figure this thing out? And you go to bed at night talking to God about it. You wake up in the middle of the night. Whoa, I'll check that out and see if that'll work. And sure enough, you come up with a good idea. enjoys commanding others I like to tell people what to do no I don't like telling people what to do but I delight in obeying God and if I'm going to be obedient to God what do obedient people do 
How do obedient people relate to the people under them? People who are obedient to God will let the people who they supervise do as they please. Does that sound right? If I'm being obedient to God and God has standards for the way we should live, the people I supervise will be required to live according to those standards? My teenage daughter said, Dad, why are you so much more strict than other kids' parents? I said, because you're special. Did any of you have parents say that to you? Because you're so special, God has a special plan for your life? Well, I don't like being so special. <laughs> well, how about this one? If I didn't, if I didn't require this of you, I would be disobeying God. And as much as I'd like to make you a happy little camper, I have to please God more than I please people. And if that means getting you bent a little crossways, then so be it. You'll just have to... And then I did say, I told them when they were younger, I said, then, and if you think I'm being too strict, just pray that God will, will soften my heart and make me a better father. And Esther, one day one of my girls rolled her eyes at me when I said that. Do you guys know what it means when a girl rolls her eyes at you? Like, will that ever happen? No. And I looked that young lady in the face and I said, and if you really think that God can't change me because I'm too stubborn, I authorize you to ask for a new father, that God will just take me out of the picture and <laughs> send you one that will do right by you. And then after I said it, when she left, she goes, Dad, you're not that bad. I said, well, I'm glad to hear it. And then after she left, I said, Lord, I can't believe what I just said. But uh, if I am that bad, please fix me so I don't be such a bad parent because I kind of like watching these girls grow up, you know. But it's just like sometimes, I mean, in your endeavor to be obedient to God, you can become very demanding of other people. The people you supervise because because you're trying to help kids gain a biblical perspective on life and they come into the room just filled with all kinds of garbage we got to get this stuff straight you've got this orphanage with these little children coming in who have come from well they're orphans because they come from terrible situations and if anything they need to see the glory of God surrounding them you can't afford to have people who are not reflecting Jesus in their demeanor. You're going to Japan and want to attract these young kids to Christ? I mean, you don't have time to mess around with nonsense. We want people who are serious about reaching their friends for Christ. There's a whole lot of people in Japan who uh, spent too many years worshiping ancestors, haven't they? And it's time to worship the, the God of their ancestors and get their lives straightened out. And for some people, that's a, I mean, that, that's a pretty radical thing because it's almost like, I suppose it would be true talk, in, in Japan, if, if when I was 18 in, in, in Oklahoma and I got saved, okay, my father wasn't a happy camper about me becoming this religious nut, but if I'd have been in Japan... I would be turning away from, I would still respect my ancestors, but I'd be turning away from worshiping ancestors, wouldn't I? And that, that has to be a pretty traumatic thing, doesn't it? But look at the other side of that. For you, those of you who don't grow up in that kind of culture, look, look at the side of that where you, you, you worship your great-grandparents. I mean, no matter, how much, no matter how much my grandparents and great-grandparents meant to me, they, they, can't, they can't help improve the quality of my life today. Only the creator God of the universe can do the kind of thing that I want done in my life. And you know what I think is really cool about, uh, well, I don't, okay, I'm, I'm going to say it's about Japan, but also about China. 
You know who become, you know the people who become some of the leaders in those societies are the Christians? And I don't know if this is true in Japan or not, but I do, I do know that some American businessmen who wanted, who, who actually tried to tell the car manufacturers in Detroit how to make a better car, to make the customers happier, so they would sell more cars. The people in Detroit wouldn't listen to them. So the guy who wrote the book on how to build a better car went to Japan, and the Japanese listened to him. And what happened in America after a few years? Everybody's buying Toyotas and Hondas, and the American car business is falling apart because they wouldn't embrace this quality control stuff that was being offered by uh, people who were saying, you have to build a car that, well, I mean, you can buy a car today that will run 250,000 miles. Did you know in the heyday of Detroit, when they were making all these new fancy looking cars that everybody bought them for just the way it looks, they didn't intend for you to drive a car for 250,000 miles. They intended for it to last maybe 30 or 40 and then wear out, break down, and you'd go buy another one. It's just, I mean, if you, if you buy a car that goes 250,000 miles, you won't sell very many cars to a guy. But the quality control that Japan picked up on, but in China today, I see, because I teach this stuff, I do some research on what's going on, some of the most successful people in China who have contracts to provide things in America, when, when they're interviewed to find out what it is that makes your company so great, they're, they're Christians embracing Christian principles of the way they treat their workers so they have better quality control in what they manufacture that they sell to America. And even though China is officially not Christian, they allow these Christians to run these businesses because they're making China so successful in the business world. Christian, Christianity improves the quality of life in society. I don't know how much history you know about this stuff and how it plays out, but uh, did you know that in France at one time Protestant Christianity was a powerful force. A guy named Hugo, during the Reformation, studied under Luther, came back to France to bring Reformation Christianity to the French people. French people got saved. In Catholic France, that creates a problem. And the French people who got saved became the productive, working, middle-class French people who made France the strongest economy on the face of the earth. Then, Catholic influence in France influenced the French government to tell the Protestants that they were tired of having them around and they had to either, they had to leave the country so where did all the French Protestants go? My ancestors, who were French Huguenots, who were Huguenots, went to England as religious exiles, then came to America and became part of the American middle class. German immigrants came here for religious freedom. Ukrainian immigrants came here for religious freedom. English immigrants came here to America for religious freedom and became the productive, working, middle class that made us the strongest economy in the world. Were you taught that in school or anywhere? Did you learn that in homeschooling? Did you get that in your books in homeschooling? Your parents bought a curriculum that had that Christian influence. Did you get that in your school? Talk, did you get that in your school about what made America the great nation it is today? Was the Christian, productive, working middle class? It was even called the Protestant work ethic. 
Now, think about it. What's the work ethic that we Protestants, that we Christians embrace? Okay, you get a job, and what does the Bible say about how you do your work? You do your work as unto the Lord. You submit to those in authority over you. You do what your boss tells you to do without giving him any grief. You give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. You follow what happens. We become the most productive workers on the face of the earth just by living out our Christianity in the workplace. And the end result is this country became the leader of the world and made France. See, it used to be that France was a world leader and everybody in the world learned French. It was the language of the world both educated world and and economic world. Now, what's the favored economic and educated language in the world? English. Because the French have moved to the back row because of their driving out the Protestant middle class productive people who made them such a great nation. And they still haven't figured it out. And you know what's scary about this country? We got a lot of people in power today in America who want to deny our Christian heritage and who want to minimize the Christian influence in our world and, and want to get rid of it. Okay, if we get rid of it completely as an institution or as an organization, what's going to happen to us if... If all the workers in America no longer embrace honesty and submission to authority and doing your work as unto the Lord, what happens to this corporate handshake and you keep your word? I mean, if we're not honest with each other, our system of government, our system of business falls apart. It's built on honest dealings with one another, making a deal and keeping your word. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. They think, oh no, we'll all be honest just because it's the American thing to do. We'll be honest as long as our Christian heritage still lingers in our conscience to keep us that way. All it takes is enough time to pass beyond that where, hey, honesty just goes, once honesty goes out the door and it's what, buyer beware and Everybody looks out for his own interest and nobody does the job as unto the Lord. It's crazy. Okay, enough of that. Let's see. What's my next one here? 26 characteristics of true leaders. What are these 26 characteristics? There's 26 for you. 26 for you and 26 for you. From John MacArthur. What's the first on the list? The leader is trustworthy. 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 When you can no longer trust people. Wow. Okay, let's just talk about some leaders. I guess the most powerful leader in America would be the president. Can you trust what he says? Eh, maybe, maybe not. The second most powerful leaders in America would be the people in the Congress. Trustworthy? Maybe, maybe not. Not all the time. Not all the time. Let's see. So let's move down from politics. Let's go over to the news media. The people who lead the news that's broadcast to America, can you trust them? Can what they, I mean, they tell you something, you hear something on the news, you go, well, that has to be true because it's on the news. Someone told me something the other day that they reported that was reported on the news and I'm going what and so I got on the internet to check it out 
And guess what? It was a lie. Did somebody, did some news reporter deliberately lie to the American people to influence our thinking? Have you ever heard this phrase, the end justifies the means? Have you ever heard that phrase anywhere? Did you know there's a lot of people in America today who believe that the goal that I have in mind is so right that I can use any means to get people to agree with, to get people to move that direction, whether it's honest or not. See, I was raised in a world where honesty is the best policy. And that if you aren't trustworthy, then who's going to do business with you? And the world is changing. Have you ever worked for a boss who wasn't trustworthy? Have you ever worked someplace where your supervisor would say one thing and do another? How long would you work there once you found that out? You say, I'm looking for a new job where I can get a boss I can trust. So what are the other 25 characteristics? You take some initiative, which probably means you take a risk. You use good judgment. Where do you go to find good judgment? Where does wisdom come from? The Bible. You speak with authority. Where do you get your authority? By the way, the Bible's our ultimate authority, right? Okay. When I used to work with teenagers, I would tell them what God says about things, and every now and then they would say, that's what you say, Mr. Bonine, but I don't think the Bible says that. So I'd pull out the Bible, and I'd open it up, and I would turn it, and I'd say, Daniel, read what this verse says. And Daniel would read it, and I'd say, so what does it say? And he said, I guess it says I should obey my parents. I said, you guess? You're not sure? Read it again. <laughs> what does Ephesians 6, 1 and 2 say? <coughs> he says, yes, it says obey your parents. And then talk says, well, it doesn't say obey them in all things. So do you have a cross-reference Bible with you? That goes from Ephesians 6, 1 over to Colossians. And guess what the passage in Colossians says? And I say, talk, read the passage in Colossians. And talk, reads, children, obey your parents in all things. I said, what does it say, talk? He says, I guess it says all things. I said, you guess it says? What does God say about it? And see, if all they hear me, if, if all they hear is God's words being repeated out of my mouth, they'll attribute it to, that's what Dr. Bonine thinks. Once they look at it in the Bible and see it for themselves, now they're face to face with God's Word. And I'm convinced we have to take people to the source of authority. They have to look at the Bible to see what it says about it and read it so they can apply it to their lives. Yeah, we didn't buy that game. A leader, number five, makes other people stronger. He's optimistic and enthusiastic. He doesn't compromise on the absolutes of God's word. He empowers by example. Number nine. I'm just skipping down some of these. Number 11. He has empathy for others. 12. He keeps a clear conscience. I've asked some people who run businesses, how do you sleep at night? I said to a guy who was taking care of taking advantage of old people. I just called him up and I said, how do you sleep at night? You go over and sell these old people stuff and you have them sign contracts to where they owe you tons of money and they don't even know what they're doing. How do you sleep at night? Don't you know how to make an honest living? And he goes, what are you talking about? And I thought, the guy has so hardened and calloused his conscience, he doesn't even feel that what he's doing is wrong. One time I said to a guy, so if I went to your mother's house and, and 
sold her stuff like you're selling to my Aunt Margie, that would be okay with you? And then he goes, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Sounds like a teenager now, doesn't it? I guess. No, it wouldn't be okay with me. It's like, it, treat my Aunt Margie like you would treat your own mother. That's what the guy ought to be doing. Number 13, you're definite and decisive. Number 14, you know when to change your mind about something. Boy, when my girl said, Dad, why do we have to go to bed so early at night? I said, because when I was your age, that's when I had to go to bed. And they go, yeah, but Dad, you grew up on a farm where you had to get up in the morning and do chores. You were out there at the crack of dawn or earlier feeding cattle and stuff. We don't have to get up that early. I'm going, huh, you're right, you don't. Well, girls, I guess I need to change the way I think about this bedtime stuff. I said, tell you what. I said, you tell me when you want to go to bed. And so they gave me a time that I thought was too late. I said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. I'll let you stay up that late on one condition. That when your mother comes in to wake you up in the morning to go to school, if there's any complaints, then I set your bedtime for the next night. And I really thought my teenage daughters would fail that test and then I would be setting their bedtime for them. You know what they did? No matter how late they stayed up, when their mother woke them up in the morning, they didn't say one cranky word to her because they knew old dad was waiting to nail us. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden I realized they developed some real internal discipline, didn't they? And come home from school sleepy thinking, I, I need to take a nap. I wish I would have gone to bed earlier last night. So you know when to change your mind. And 15, you don't abuse your authority. Just because you have the power, don't misuse it. Don't let it go to your head. Number 16, you don't abdicate your role in the face of opposition. Just because people don't agree or criticize, don't change the, if you're doing the right thing, you're sure of what God has called you to do. Number 18, you know your own limitations. There's a book written about that out there. There's a theory in the business world in America. It's called the Written a, a book's written by a guy named years ago by a guy named Peter Drucker. It's called the Peter Principle because it's based on his name. It doesn't have to do with Peter in the Bible. It's his name, Peter Drucker. But here's what he wrote in his book. He said, in the, in the corporate world in America, if you're good at what you do, you've earned a promotion. So they from like, for example, in the insurance business, if you're a good salesman, they'll promote you to be a manager of the sales office. And if you're a good sales office manager, they'll promote you to be a district manager. And if you're a good district manager, they'll promote you to be a division manager in the home office. Okay? Let's say they promote you to district manager and you're a mediocre district manager. You were a, a great office manager, but now you're a mediocre district manager where you manage a whole bunch of offices. So they leave you there for the rest of your life. Where you spend the rest of your life being mediocre? Because they won't promote you to the home office because you're not that successful. So if you really want to feel fulfilled for the rest of your life, you need to ask for a demotion back to where you were before. But nobody wants to ask for that. So the idea is that a whole bunch of people in corporate America spend their lives being mediocre at something that they're not as good at as they were the level one below. So have you figured out what the lesson is to learn from that? Okay, my calling is being a professor, a classroom teacher. I've been an administrator. I could have moved from being an academic dean to a vice president. I mean, aren't you gonna just keep moving up the corporate ladder? And what's my answer? No, because that isn't what God has called me to do. And when I was in the insurance business, and they said, Tom, we would like to move you to Omaha and make you an office manager. And I said, why? They said, because you're so good at selling insurance. I said, so what makes you think I'd be good at managing other people? And they said, well, that's just the way this business works. And here's what would have happened. If I would have moved to Omaha, I would have had to supervise about a half a dozen people 
that ought to be out selling insurance on a regular basis. Okay, when I was just an insurance man on my own, the only guy I had to supervise was me. And some of the guys I worked with, I would not want to be their supervisor. They were just a bunch of deafers. You know what I'm talking about? They just didn't want to get up and go to work. Do I want to move from being a successful insurance salesman to a mediocre office manager doing something that I don't enjoy? Why would I do that? Oh, because it's a promotion. And people applaud you for moving up the corporate ladder. You, you follow how America works? And so Peter Drucker hit on something. Watch out that you don't let yourself be promoted to the level of mediocrity. I mean, my, my supervisor said I was a good academic dean. Okay, but see, I would say, okay, I'm a good academic dean with small letter good. I'm a good professor with bigger level good. You follow me? But those are, this, that's this organization. I'm a good father with even a bigger good. I'm actually a good grandfather too. And that's probably the biggest good that I get today. And that's probably the most important good to me in terms of what I do. Is It's just like, yeah. Nobody else can be a grandfather to my grandchildren. That's my, I'm the only one can do that job the way I do it. Other people would teach these classes. But I enjoy what I'm doing and I want to be good at what I do. But be careful that you don't allow yourself to be promoted to the place to where you become mediocre at something when you could be very good at a different level. Just be content with what God has called you to do and don't get too carried away with all the other stuff down the road. Okay, that's enough of that one because we're almost out of time. And I have another one here from Gangle's book. 21 questions for spiritual leaders. Wow. Look at these questions. Ken Gangle wrote these questions when he was a seminary professor. Can you identify areas where you've matured during your four years in seminary? I guess, can you identify areas where you've matured in your relationship to God during your time here at Calvary? Or have you just been earning a degree? Do you understand? Are you growing spiritually? Is your highest priority knowing God and walking in fellowship with Him? Is every is in the everyday situation of life, do you tend to react to them according to a biblical perspective? Do you have a short fuse? Where do you become impatient most often? Where's your greatest capacity for becoming impatient with people? Mine's at traffic lights. The light turns green, and I'm looking at the light when it turns green, and what am I expecting the three cars in front of me to be doing? Hitting the gas pedal. Instead, here's what I think is going on. Ma, did that light turn green? I don't know, Pa. I wasn't watching. <laughs> well, my eyes aren't working very well. And I want to just take my horn and go, you people, get off the phone. Quit messing around. Drive your car. And Nina says, Tom, you know why God has you encounter so many red lights in life? I'm going, why? She said, he's trying to teach you patience. Did I ask for that, guys? Did I ask? <laughs> did I ask my wife to make any comments about it? And she goes, "Tom, that's my job. That's why God put me here is to help you." So I said, "I need to work on this thing at stoplights." And guess what I discovered? If I put it in a CD, if I put it in a disc that has some Christian music on it, and I play Christian music and sing praises to God, it doesn't matter how long people sit at that light in front of me. 
or if I spend that time praying for people, I just find out I have to spend, I have to do something else to keep from uh, becoming impatient with people. Your family, is your family a priority? You better, you better realize that, okay, my boss here at the school isn't, isn't looking out to see that I'm being a good grandfather. You, you follow me? That's not his job. His job is to make sure I'm a good professor in the classroom. He's not going to check with my wife to see if I'm being a good husband or a good father or a good grandfather. That's my job to take care of that. You follow what's going on? So I can't <clears throat> expect my boss to watch out for my grandchildren. I have to do that. Just like when someone said, Tom, could, would you teach some classes for us over at the seminary? And I said, what would that involve? And they said, it, in, it, it required teaching at night and teaching in the summertime. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Why not? Because nights and summers are when I watch my grandchildren play sports. Maybe when my grandkids are all grown up and they're not playing sports anymore, then I can go teach those classes. But it might be by the time that happens, I'll be too old to teach those classes. Then I guess somebody else will just have to teach them. But you understand, I could book my life so full of teaching that I don't have time for my own kids and grandkids. That would be a mistake. Well, look at those 24 questions, 21 questions, and keep them handy as a reference for your own personal life as well as for using them in ministry. Okay. Turn these sideways. Why is it that I'm starting off the first day and I'm behind already? <laughs> made by Lipton with lemon in it. I'm going to bring some of that to class with me every day. I guess I should have rolled out too.